So then I want to go to this subject of self-organizing systems. Okay, this is a very uh, old piece of software uh, called the Game of Life. And uh, it was invented by an American mathematician called John Conway in Princeton back in the 70s when he didn't have computers. He used to do it by hand. The way it works is very simple. You have this grid, and onto this grid you can write or you can put in little blue dots. And, you make, and, and Conway made a couple of rules that what happens to a blue dot depends on what happens to its neighbors. And then you fill this up, let's say, with a random pattern of dots. Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> you see, there, there are stable patterns beginning to form there. Well, it settles down to, to what in physics we would call a dynamic equilibrium. Nothing's going to change now. The rules are working, but it, it's now a pattern. Conway looked at this. Conway uh, interpreted this as a, a possible hint towards the mechanism that makes life happen. I think in today's understanding of neurophysiology, it's probably closer to how thought happens. This, perhaps, is a very crude representation of a thought. Because inside our heads, fairly identical mechanisms work between neurons being interconnected with each other, each neuron state depending on the state of all its neighboring neurons. And there are a couple of trillions of them. So are we looking at thought? A self-organizing system is defined as a, a, a structure which appears from outside it. So, so the creator has no control over what comes out, over the outcome. Um, what are some examples of it? Well, traffic jams, the stock markets, society and disaster recovery. You know, when there's a great disaster and the systems fail, then all large societies self-organize. Terrorism and insurgency, as opposed to war, are self-organizing <laughs> systems, which is why they're so hard to predict, so hard to control, and so on. We, of course, in our subject, saw since yesterday several examples of self-organizing systems in education. You know, Second Life, Moodle, Wiki, we heard about all of that. So it's in this context that I uh, come to the work that I, I do. These are self-organizing systems in education. So the idea is that if good schools can't exist in a particular place, is it possible to create some kind of a self-organizing system that will produce some kind of learning. What kind of learning will it be, and who can use it? Now, I know that several people here have heard this part of the talk, but several people haven't, so I, I necessarily have to repeat a bit. Uh, I started with a whole set of experiments, the first of which was done in uh, New Delhi in uh, January of 1999. I used to work for a company called NIIT at that time, an education and training company. Uh, also a software development company in, in Delhi. They had this very plush office, and surrounding the office was a boundary wall. And just outside the boundary wall, there was a big, sprawling slum. Inside the office, there were thousands and thousands of computers and networks and young men and women who were software engineers, teachers, and so on. What I did was I broke an opening in the wall because I wanted to make the two sides meet. So I broke an opening there, put a glass pane against it, put the monitor against the glass pane, put broadband internet on it, uh, put it on altavista.com, which was the search engine of those days, put a touchpad also buried into the wall, and I just left it there. It was about three feet above the ground. Then I asked a colleague of mine to take a video camera and go around and, and you know, just film anything interesting that might happen. This is what he brought back after eight hours. That's an IIT in the background. And this is what got called, eventually, the hole in the wall. After eight hours, we saw this 
eight-year-old boy on your right, he is the son of the local tobacco seller. His father sells cigarettes outside. To his left is a student, a six-year-old girl. What, what they were doing was very interesting. He was teaching her how to browse. Now, that raised a lot of questions. Is this real? Does language matter? They're not supposed to know English. Will the computer last, or will they just break it and take it away? That's what my boss asked me. <coughs> and did anyone teach them? When I came back after two months, I saw this eight-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl, and they were playing some kind of a game on the computer. As soon as they saw me, they said, we need a better mouse and a faster processor. <laughs> so, 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 so you know, then I asked them, <laughs> how do you know all this? And uh, they said something which is very important for educationists to know, I think. They said, if you give us a you've given us a computer which works only in English, so we taught ourselves English in order to use it. This is diametrically opposite to the adult perception of learning. An adult would have said, you've given me a machine that works in a language that I don't know, therefore I cannot use it. Two negatives. The children convert it to two positives. If I don't know the language, if I learn the language, I can use it. So very important, I think, for pedagogues to understand this. So Marantusi showed that language is not a barrier. In fact, children may be able to learn a language on their own. At this time, it was becoming obvious that more than computer literacy, other things were also happening. So what am I uh, doing over there now is that I have uh, what I call self, I'm setting up what I call self-organized learning environments. They're not exactly like hole in the wall, but the lesson is the same, that it's groups of children interacting with computers, not a single child and single computer, but groups, heterogeneous groups, unsupervised groups with no timetables. The Long Benton project, this is in England. Here, the problem is that the children's aspiration levels are low. This is a, a disadvantaged area. Their aspirations are low. And when I first came to England, uh, people told me, be careful. So I said, be careful of what? They said, be careful of the children. So I, I, it, you know, coming from India, that was a real big culture shock. So I, so I said, what do, you, what do you mean, be careful of the children? I said, you know, those, uh, you know, late in the evenings and all that, stay away from the teenagers, they'll kill you. So, uh, so I, I couldn't resist the temptation. I went straight into the metro at 10.30 in the evening. <laughs> and true enough, there they were, purple hair sticking out all over the place, things stuck inside their cheeks and all of that. So they were sitting there. So I went right up there, and they were smoking a cigarette in the Anyway, I went up to them, and I said, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, you know, I've just arrived from India and in, uh, England, and I've been told that you guys might kill me. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, so they were absolutely horrified. They said, no, sir. <laughs> so, so, who, who told you that? So I said, can I sit down? And they said, yes, sir. All through the, the conversation, they referred to me as sir. And they were extremely polite. And they were very curious about India. And I, I asked them, why don't you guys want to become a nice professor like me? <laughs> so they said, and that explained it all. They said, why should I work for, for 16 years to become a professor like you when I can earn more than half of what you earn by being a bus driver? So I thought at that time, what would happen if one were to design educational technology for the underprivileged first? Almost no technology is created for the underprivileged to start with. If you take a pair of expensive Nike shoes and put them in the rice paddies of Vietnam, they'll last for like 15 minutes. If you could design a pair of shoes that last in the rice paddies of Vietnam, they will work forever in Manhattan. Groups of children can learn to use computers and the internet on their own, and a very important result there, irrespective of who or where they are. Exactly the same results, you know. And as a physicist, I feel very happy, because this sort of results come only in the natural sciences. But it happens absolutely in the same way everywhere. 
for it to happen, the computers and internet must be provided in a safe public place that can be associated with free time and with play. Children must have control over the, over the device. Between 200 and 300 children share one computer effectively to become computer literate in three months. It's an absurd number. If you, if you do the arithmetic, it's just a few seconds per child, but that's not how it works. What actually happens is, at any point in time, there's one child operating the computer. There are three children around him, usually exactly three, who are advising him and discussing what's going on on the screen. If you take away that interaction, there'll be no progress. Around the four children, there are about 12 or 16 children in a, in a circle who are watching the whole process, making a lot of noise, and providing a lot of wrong advice to everybody else. <laughs> so if, if you test that whole group of 20 children, all of them know exactly what's going on on the screen. I think you really emphasize right now we've got at least 200 million kids out of school who will never see the insides of a school in their lives alive now in Asia and Africa. At least 200 million. And if we're not prepared to do anything for them because we're not prepared to see them going to a school without walls and without teachers, could we at least do something like this? So, so it can be done. It's a question of setting some kind of an example, uh, showing that it will work. Uh, about the hardware which you give to this, deliver to that places, be accessible for the children. There are different approaches to this, and uh, in line of the kind of scarcity of the resources and the saving resources and everything go and recycling as a very important part of it. Uh, I wonder if you support the idea, which is kind of fashionable, that let's recycle what is already, what already does not serve in the first world and send it out there to reach out the third world. Um, At the same time, I have heard a very strong opposition to this, that discounted and uh, second use, uh, second hand, uh, is not only, not only serves the purpose, but maybe even damages. The, the so the fastest CPUs should go into the disadvantaged areas. When, once the children are tired of them, we could take them back and use them in the offices. <laughs>